Assalamu alaikum students. The essay that we are going to be discussing today is one that has been written by Sir Richard Steele. And uh, before we go on with what he is going to discuss with us today, let me uh, remind you that we are going to be discussing essays on different topics. Some of them uh, are uh, topics that are of uh, everyday uh, discussion. But you need to remember that since uh, Joseph Addison and Richard Steele were basically from the aristocratic class, they're not going to be um, discussing things that are of interest to, uh, let's say, the very lowest stratum of society. They are definitely dealing with the higher stratum of society and therefore um, their topics of interest are going to be topics of interest to either the aristocracy or the educated class or a combination of the two. That is aristocrats who are also able to read and write and by the time that we see the spectator being published it is already the 18th century and in the 18th century um, you have a lot of the uh, arist aristocracy who uh, are able not only to read and write but also to appreciate uh, good writing. Okay, So um, let us see what uh, Steele has for us today. The uh, essay as you can see is titled number 172 and it was published on the 17th of September 1711. All right, now the, the format that uh, was adopted by Addison and Steele in The Spectator was, as you know by now, that each of them began with a quotation from the Latin. In doing this, the uh, essayist acknowledges the supremacy, the greatness, the genius of the masters. And uh, in keeping with the tradition of the spectator, this essay that is number 172 starts off also with a Latin uh, quotation uh, which has been taken by Tully from a quotation in Greek by Plato. So uh, as neoclassicists, um, Addison and Steele are going back to the classical writers. They are going back to antiquity and this is just one example of how um, they seek inspiration from the classics. Um, now you have uh, studied a bit in your uh, poetry and in drama and you know that the period that we are now talking about is no more the renaissance of uh, let's say Francis Bacon. This is the period that is the restoration and onwards. So uh, most of these essays were composed during the reign of Queen Mary II and King William III and this is the time when a lot of uh, focus is on um, learning and education side by side with the other frivolous aspects um, that were um, so popular with, um, with, with the courtiers. So Addison and Steele being representatives of the aristocratic class are also dealing with ideas and thoughts um, that would be of interest to the aristocratic circles. There can be no greater injury to humane society and I want you students to pay particular attention to the words that Steele is using because um, a lot of these words are not used in the same sense anymore. Um, you will even see that there is a difference in construction, in the way that the words have been put together. When we talk about 
English as a language, we talk about a certain word order. So we say that the subject comes first and then the, you have the verb and then you will have the predicate or the complement or the object or whatever. So it is SVO or SV uh, whatever. So uh, in this uh, particular subject you will see that since we are dealing with essays that have been written in the 18th century you will see a slightly different structure of the sentence. I'm not going to say that the word order has been inverted but it's a different structure. You might not see the same words used as the same parts of speech for example um, if you go back to the um, lectures that we had on Francis Bacon, I pointed out to you that Bacon uses a certain, uh, let's say, spelling order that is not used anymore or he uses a word as, for example, a noun which is now used as a verb and vice versa. So the same thing continues into the 18th century and in the writings of Addison and Steele you will see words that are used in a different manner or in a different meaning or in a different context than what the same word would be used in in the 21st century. So I need you to keep this firmly in mind as we proceed with uh, Bacon's um, essays and as we go on with the essays published in The Spectator by Addison and Steele. So this essay written by Steele also will show you certain examples and I'll point out these places as we go on where words are used in a different manner from the way they're used now in the 21st century. So he says there can be no greater injury to humane society than that good talents among men should be held honorable to those who are endowed with them without any regard how they are applied. Now in this sentence Steele is not using the word to. The sentence without any regard if you were to write it now, it would read without any regard to how they are applied or to the manner of application. So a slightly different um, setup and setting of words. The gifts of nature and accomplishments of art are valuable, but as they are exerted in the interest of virtue or governed by the rules of honor. So the very first paragraph describes to you what is going to be discussed in this essay. If you go back to the very initial lectures, I pointed out a couple of things to you and one of the things that I focused on was that in an essay, um, the first paragraph is the introductory paragraph and that opens the argument as it were for what is discussed later on in the essay. So the first paragraph is the introductory paragraph and the paragraphs that follow only support what has been stated in the first paragraph. And what Steele is saying here in the first paragraph is that um, there can be no greater harm done to society than to have, um, let's say, talented people acknowledged not because of the impact that their work has on society but on how it is presented. Now this is a slightly um, complex idea but Steele is going to discuss this in detail so that you will by the end of this lecture understand what exactly he means when he says there can be no greater injury to humane society. What he's talking about basically 
is mankind and what is important for mankind. So what he is saying is that talent is all very well but in order to have maximum benefit talent is dependent upon its application. It's not sufficient to have talent, to have genius, but it is even more important to have that genius applied in such a way that you have maximum benefit for society. You have maximum benefit for mankind. So he says, it is as they are exerted in the interest of virtue in the spread of goodness rather than evil. So he says what is important is not the talent itself but on what benefit that talent will bring to society. We ought to abstract our minds from the observation of any excellence in those we converse with, that is people that we communicate with, till we have taken some notice or received some good information of the disposition of their minds. So what he is emphasizing here is that if we find excellence, if we find talent in a man, we must not start appreciating from, from the word go. We need to think of how the individual wants to have that talent applied for the benefit of mankind. As he says, until we have conversed with that person, until we have determined how that talent is going to be applied. So mere discovery of talent is not enough. What we need to find out is how it is going to be applied. So as he says, otherwise the beauty of their persons or the charms of their wit may make us fond of those whom our reason and judgment tell us we ought to abhor. So we must not only feel, we must also think. Now what Steele is emphasizing here is the importance of judgment and reason. The reason why he is doing it is because human beings have a tendency to get carried away by their emotions. You like somebody's face, you like somebody's personality, you like somebody's intellect and you are impressed at once and you say so and so is wonderful, so and so is excellent. So what Steele wants us to do is to take a deep breath, to pause and to try to determine how that beauty, that wit or that charm is going to be utilized. So what he's concerned with is utilization. How much benefit can be derived from that talent. Human beings are fallible. Human beings have a tendency to get carried away by their sentiments, and their feelings and emotions. So in a situation where we appreciate wit, intelligence, or even beauty, physical beauty. Steel advises us to pause, to reflect, and then to decide on the basis of the benefit that is going to accrue to humanity, whether that individual should be praised or not. And he's going to describe it in greater detail in the succeeding paragraphs. So, mere charm is not enough, mere physical beauty is not enough. You must be able to determine 
how that beauty is going to be used, how that intelligence is going to be utilized for the benefit of mankind. So what he's trying to emphasize here is the fact that when we appreciate someone, we must do it not because we like the physical person, not because um, the wit has attracted our imagination, but because of that whole person, because of how that talent is going to be utilized. Because you don't want to, uh, let's say, um, say, oh, so-and-so is beautiful or so-and-so is so intelligent. And then 10 minutes later, when you start thinking of um, what impact that individual is having on society, you, you've, you decide that this person is not to be appreciated. He is rather to be abhorred. That would be a very uncomfortable feeling um, to have. And this is what he's going to um, explain in the next slide also when he says, when we suffer ourselves to be thus carried away by mere beauty or mere wit, we will bear as much of our goodwill as the most innocent virgin or discreetest matron. In other words, he is trying to say that there's no such thing as an innocent virgin, just as there is no matron or married woman who is discreet. And there cannot be a more abject slavery in this world than to dote upon what we think we ought to condemn. Now, here's a different idea. What he's trying to say is, and I personally think, being a woman, that it's a rather sexist comment that Steele makes here. But um, let's deal with um, this entire uh, slide in one go. What he's saying is that to be carried away by the physical beauty or by the intelligence of a person is something that we're going to regret. And he doesn't want anyone to have regrets. So he says, if we are carried away by our emotions, by our sentiments and feelings, then we will land ourselves into what he calls the most abject slavery. That is, the worst possible position is when you appreciate an individual for something that he possesses without trying to determine how that talent or that beauty is going to be utilized. That's, that, according to Steele, is about the worst possible thing that can happen. Okay? So there can be no more abject slavery than to appreciate in, uh, in one sentence what we are going to abhor and condemn in the next sentence. Because when we start thinking, when we use reason, judgment, um, we, when we use our minds to analyze uh, that same beauty, that same intelligence, we might decide that this is not to be appreciated that this is definitely to be condemned. And a while back, I pointed out that um, certain structures in steel are different, certain words are used differently. Um, and I gave you the example of um, how Bacon spells certain words differently because of the time in which he was living. So you see that the last word here, condemn, is written with a T. Now, in the 21st century, when we write the word, we write it with a D. It's still a hard sound. It's not contempt, it's condemn. But the meaning is the same. Okay? So, he says, don't get carried away by beauty, by wit, by intelligence, until you have used your reason and judgment and determined how far that beauty or that intelligence is going to impact 
mankind, how, uh, how much benefit human beings will be able to derive from that intelligence or that talent. Yet this must be our condition in all the parts of life if we suffer ourselves to approve anything but what tends to the promotion of what is good and honorable. So it is very important that these talents be used for the good of mankind, that they be used for the benefit of society. If we would take true pains with ourselves to consider all things by the light of reason and justice, though a man were in the height of youth and amorous inclinations, he would look upon a coquette with the same contempt or indifference as he would upon a coxcomb. All right. Now, there, the, the idea that's been given here, again, is something that applies um, to the society of uh, Steele's time and there are different ideas that he gives here. Um, he says that we, knew, we need to use the light of reason. Now you have to remember that Addison and Steele were writing in an age which is known as the age of reason. It is the neoclassical age. It's also known as the age of reason. This is the time when men used um, the rational side uh, of their nature more than the emotional or sentimental side. So reason, the light of judgment, um, is something that is given a lot of importance during uh, the, the, the age um, in which Addison and Steele were writing. So the 18th century is definitely the age of reason and that is why Steele says that uh, even a young man, one who is of a very impressionable age and um, if, enc if he encounters beauty he is very easily impressed, he says once he uses his mind, his brains, um, he will be able to differentiate between a coquette, that is um, a woman who is just flirting, and a coxcomb. And you know what a coxcomb is? You've read Shakespeare? Well, let me tell you. A coxcomb is a man whose wife is deceiving himself. So young men are very easily taken in if a woman, a beautiful woman, pays attention to them. And so such a young man um, is because he's of an impressionable age, uh, is very easily swayed by what a beautiful woman will say. But if he uses his mind, if he uses his judgment, then he will be able to see exactly what that woman is saying. He'll be able to understand the implications of a beautiful woman's speech. Okay, so reason, rationality, judgment is what this age, that is the age of Addison and Steele, laid a lot of focus on. The wanton carriage in a woman would disappoint her of the admiration which she aims at, and the vain dress or discourse of a man would destroy the comeliness of his shape or goodness of his understanding. So if the young people start using their brains, start using their minds, uh, or as they say, kidneys, um, they will be able to differentiate between true and false. He talks about the wanton carriage of a woman, a woman who walks in a very seductive manner, in a way which attracts the maximum uh, attention of the men. Just as for the men, it is vain dress and discourse with which they 
um, seek to attract the attention of the women folk. Now you see what Steele presents here is a beautiful woman who walks in a manner in that attracts the attention of the men and on the other hand you have men who um, give a lot of time and attention and spend a lot of money on their clothes just so that they can attract the attention of the beautiful women. So the, the, the attention that they give to the dress is so that they will appear more handsome and they will appear more attractive to the women. But um, they are not concerned with what benefit society can derive from them. They're just focusing on um, their appearance, their dress and their speech. They're not thinking for a second about what they can do for society. So that the, what um, Steele is trying to emphasize here is the fact that we must not get carried away by appearance or by the speech of an individual, we must try to determine what good um, that person will do for society and mankind. I say the goodness of, the, of his understanding, for it is no less common to see men of sense commence coxcombs than beautiful women become immodest. So he says that just because we are men does not mean that we cannot be made idiots. It's very easy. Um, the most intelligent of men, uh, the most highly placed of men, can be made a fool of very, very easily. When this happens, the favor we are naturally inclined to give to the good qualities they have from nature should abate in proportion. So, if a woman becomes a flirt or a man is, becomes a fool, we no longer appreciate them in the same manner that we did earlier. So, mere brains, mere beauty, mere intelligence is not enough. You need to know how that intelligence is going to be used to benefit humanity. However just it is to measure the value of men by the application of their talents and not by the eminence of those qualities abstracted from their use, I say however just such a way of judging is in all ages as well as this the contrary has prevailed upon the generality of mankind. Now, what he's saying here is, no matter how true you may think it is that intelligent men, beautiful women must also work for the benefit of society. No matter how true this is, no matter how just it is, this reality is that the exact opposite happens. Beautiful women make idiots of men. Vain men who devote a lot of time and attention to their dress and their speech make fools of women. So it works both ways. And they not only make fools of each other, but they also hold important positions in society. And that, Steele says, is the irony of the situation. Logically speaking, such people should not be in a position where they can influence society. But reality is, history tells us, that this is what has always happened. How many lewd devices have been preserved from one age to another? And here Steele becomes very, very critical. 
which had perished as soon as they were made if painters and sculptors had been esteemed as much for the purpose as the execution of their design. Let me show you the next slide also because these two have to be taken in conjunction. And the example that he gives of these lewd devices is, he says, modest and well-governed imaginations have by this means lost the representations of 10,000 charming portraitures filled with images of innate truth, generous zeal, courageous faith, and tender humanity. Instead of which, satires, furies, and monsters are recommended by those arts to a shameful eternity. All right, let's go back. Now, what Steele is saying here, and I, as I said before, he's very, very critical of art. The example that he gives you is from the field of sculpture. And he says, if it were true that utility or the purpose is as much important as the physical appearance. Then he says, painters and sculptors and he's taking just two categories. Painters and sculptors would have paid more attention to presenting truth, honesty, justice than presenting satires, monsters, and furies. Now what you need to keep in mind is the art that had been preserved up to the 18th century. Steele is focusing only on those, as he calls them, lewd devices. And what he's focusing on is um, the paintings and sculptures that have been preserved from antiquity and which show monsters. You know, you had uh, the Hydra, you had uh, the Gorgon, you had all those snakes instead of hair. That was being shown in sculptures and in paintings. According to Steele, that should not have happened. What they should have presented is justice, truth, faith, courage, judgment. And instead, what has been uh, the focus of painters and sculptors from times immemorial are representations of the Furies, and they are frightening to look at. Um, you have satyrs and nymphs and fauns, uh, and you have monsters like the Hydra, the Medusa, um, and, and, and all those other uh, characters from uh, classical mythology. So, uh, according to Steele, human beings have never considered what is beneficial for their society. It has always been something that turns out to be harmful for society that has been propagated. And he gives you this example of what has been presented in art. The unjust application of laudable talents is tolerated in the general opinion of men, not only in, case, in such cases as are here mentioned, but also in matters which concern ordinary life. So it's not only in painting and sculpture that we are expressing our emotions rather than our thoughts, that we're not using our judgment. But this is something that happens in ordinary life also. And 
um, the example that he gives from ordinary life you need to pay particular attention to. He says if a lawyer were to be esteemed only as he uses his parts in contending for justice and the parts he's using uh, for the brain okay so and were immediately despicable when he appeared in a cause which he could not but know was an unjust how honorable would his character be now the example that he gives you is from the field of um, of law and um, he says that we do not judge lawyers on whether they are representing truth but what we judge them on is how well they argue how uh, how well they present their case what steel finds objectionable here is the fact that we don't praise a lawyer because of the good work that he is doing. We praise the lawyer because he uses good arguments. That's a skill that he has developed in law school. But what is important in a court of justice is that justice be upheld, that truth be upheld not that the best uh, lawyer is one who wins the case the best lawyer is one who presents his arguments in a convincing manner the irony is that we give the title of best lawyer not to the person who's fighting for truth but to the person who gives arguments that are convincing so we're not upholding the cause of justice we're not upholding truth we are praising a person for his skills of argument we're not basing our judgment on what is right and wrong we are basing our judgment on what is argued as being right what is argued as being just and that may not always be the case how honorable is it in such among us who follow the profession and he's talking about the legal profession no otherwise than as laboring to protect the injured to subdue the oppressor to imprison the careless debtor and do right to the painful artificer so he says there are many of us the majority of us they um, enter the legal profession because they want to uphold the cause of justice because they want to do their maximum to prove um, that truth will triumph because they think that someone has been injured someone has had wrong done to him and that wrong must be righted that is what we think of when we enter this profession as he says we follow the profession we become lawyers because we say that we are going to uphold the cause of the oppressed but what happens when we enter the profession we fall a prey to what others are doing and that is that we start to practice our argumentative skills to convince the other person not of right but of your clients standpoint so many of this excellent character are, are overlooked by the greater number many great lawyers are overlooked by the majority of people for the simple reason that they are unable 
to present a convincing argument. They might be upholding the cause of justice, they might be on the side of right, but they're not appreciated because they're not able to convince the judge or the jury or the public. Now, when you talk about convincing the public or convincing the judge or the jury, you're talking about a skill that is termed as eloquence. And eloquence in the legal profession has nothing to do with truth and justice. This is a skill that is cultivated on the basis of powers of argumentation. Now that's something that you need to think about because truth does not always triumph. More often it is the person who presents the most convincing argument who wins out. Whether he is right or wrong is immaterial. And that, Steele says, is the biggest irony. Were the intention steadfastly considered as the measure of approbation, all falsehood would soon be out of countenance, and an address in imposing upon mankind would be as contemptible in one state of life as another. And then he gives the example, a couple of courtiers making professions of esteem would make the same figure under breach of promise as two knights of the post convicted of perjury. Now, the idea that he's giving here is, if you were to consider the intention of the lawyer or whatever profession you're following, to be important. Many people would lose the support of the public or society. But in order to do that, you need to know how that talent is going to be used. Um, law school, the legal profession, equips you with eloquence, equips you with the ability to convince. But this ability to convince must be supported by good intentions. The intention must always be to support the cause of the oppressed to uphold truth and justice. The intention must not be to convince the judge and jury. Because if that is the intention, then right will not triumph. Then truth will not triumph. Then evil and vice will triumph. So the intention is very, very important. Because if you do not give importance to the intention, then courtiers who are praising the king are actually guilty of perjury. And if you remember the story of the emperor's new clothes, the emperor was going around naked, but he was surrounded by people who were told that the emperor was wearing this wonderful new material that had been discovered and that could only be perceived by intelligent people. So everybody praised the emperor's clothes until this young boy comes up and he says, why is the emperor naked? So his intention was to uphold truth. He was a truthful boy. The rest were just courtiers trying to please the king. So if you have truth and justice prevailing, then courtiers who praise the king are actually guilty of perjury. They are liars. And they should be punished as liars, all right? Now that's an idea that was quite revolutionary. 
But conversation is fallen so low in point of morality that as they say in a bargain, let the, bu let the buyer look to it. So in friendship, he is the man in danger who is most apt to believe. He is the more likely to suffer in the commerce who begins with the, the obligation of being the more ready to enter into it. So what he's saying here is that conversation has fallen so low that people um, have started to make compromises. They, they deal with real life as they deal uh, with things that they're trying to sell. The aim is to sell, not to sell something that is good. But the aim is to sell regardless of whether the object deserves the price or the value given to it or not. So he says in commerce um, the, uh, the intention is to sell and in each case the, the winner is the person who has the most convincing argument not the one who is in the right the one who has the most convincing argument will win, will be appreciated. Not the person who is right, not the person who is honest. So he says uh, that things have changed to such an extent that truth and justice do not have any importance in this world. But those men only are truly great who place their ambition rather in acquiring to themselves the conscience of worthy enterprises than in the prospect of glory which attends them. So here he makes this uh, discrimination between uh, great men and men who are not so great. And to him, great men are those who have integrity and who have the ambition of doing right. For such people, praise and appreciation of the public do not matter. They only want to do what is right. They only want to convey what is the, what is the truth. They only want to uphold justice. They are not concerned with public opinion. They are not concerned with what people think of them. As he says, the prospect of glory does not impress them. They only want to do what is right. These exalted spirits would rather be secretly the authors of events which are serviceable to mankind than without being such to have the public fame of it. So these people are not interested in fame. They are not interested in being known as good people. They do good. They have this, those intentions. They have that ambition. They want to do the maximum to benefit mankind. And that's just what they do. They're not interested whether the public considers them good or not. And this is something that's very important coming from steel, coming in the age of reason and in a time when appearances mattered a great deal, telling the readers that appearances were not everything took a lot of courage. But Sir Richard Steele could do it just as Joseph Addison could do it. So where therefore an eminent merit is robbed by artifice or detraction, it does but increase by such endeavors of its enemies. The impotent pains which are taken to sully it or diffuse it among a crowd to the injury of a single person will naturally produce the contrary effect. The fire will blaze out and burn up all that attempt to smother what they cannot extinguish. So he says, a uh, final word of encouragement to people who are doing good. He says, 
that when you have such merit, when you have people who are willing to do the maximum for mankind, such people will be able to do what they want to. No amount of public censure or lack of fame is going to prevent these people from doing good. They go ahead and do it. They're not concerned with fame. They're not bothered if the public does not like them. They want to do good for mankind. They go ahead and do it. And Steele says that in this case, what happens is that when they do good work, the work itself is like a fire. It blazes out regardless of the attempts of people to contain it. People who want to extinguish the fire, when they cannot do it, they want to smother it, they want to put it out by force. But when you have human beings who uh, work with ambition, who have good intentions, they will be able to do the work that they have set out to do regardless of all others who might try to cause hindrance or try to prevent them from doing this work. There is but one thing necessary to keep the possession of the glory which is to hear the opposers of it with patience and preserve the virtue by which it was acquired. When a man is thoroughly persuaded that he ought neither to admire, wish for or pursue anything but what is exactly his duty, it is not in the power of seasons, persons or accidents to diminish his value. So what Steele is trying to say here is that on the path to glory these men are not and should not be detracted by the thought that the general public does not like them. And one of the things that they must inculcate in their natures is the capacity to hear what the other side has to say. Forbearance, patience, adaptability is what is required. The forbearance to hear the other side of the story to hear other people's opinions. They might be different from yours, they might be wrong. But Steele says that you must hear with patience and preserve the virtue by which this ambition is acquired. Hear the other side, be patient, give them a chance also, but at the same time Preserve the virtue, preserve the essence. When a man is thoroughly persuaded that he ought neither to admire, wish for, nor pursue anything but what is exactly his duty, it is not in the power of seasons, etc., etc., to diminish his value. So, when a man sets out to do good, then he will not be swayed, then no power on earth can sway him from his purpose, can reduce his importance, can, as he says, diminish his value. No power on earth can do that. He only is a great man who can neglect the applause of the multitude and enjoy himself independent of its favor. So great people do not require the admiration of the general public. This is indeed an arduous task. It's difficult. Nobody says it's easy. But it should comfort a glorious spirit that it is the highest step to which human nature can arrive. Triumph, applause, acclamation are dear to the mind of man. We're all human beings. But it is still a more exquisite delight to say to yourself, you have done well. 
than to hear the whole human race pronounce you glorious except you yourself can join with them in your own reflection so and this is one of those sentences which where the word order is not what it is these days so um, he says the whole human race praises you and yet you know that you have done wrong great men cannot live with their consciences if their conscience tells them that they have done wrong it does not make any difference if the entire human race says you've done a wonderful job you're excellent you're a genius a man must be convinced of the good that he has done and that conviction can only come when the intention is good so when the intention is good your conscience is at rest then you don't care what the human race thinks about you then you are not bothered with praise with applause praise and applause are good for human beings but when they are weighed by what your intentions are by what your conscience says then praise applause admiration become totally immaterial then they are of no significance whatsoever a mind thus equal and uniform may be deserted by little fashionable admirers and followers but will ever be had in reference by soul like itself the branches of the oak endure all the seasons of the year though its leaves fall off in autumn and these two will be restored with the returning spring beautiful image steel brings in right at the end of this essay when he says that you need a mind that is strong enough to withstand the pressure of public opinion but a mind that is capable of withstanding that pressure will be able to hold itself up with dignity and not bow down before public opinion and a mind such as this is like the oak tree you look at the oak tree and how strong it is and steel carries the comparison further and he says that the oak tree is standing throughout the year its leaves may fall off in autumn in winter it may be bare but winter will be followed by spring and if you go back to your romantics what is it that the poets have said and what the poet says is if winter comes can spring be far behind it is in the natural sequence of events that's how nature operates when you have winter you also have spring so a mind that is strong enough to withstand the pressure of public opinion is like an oak tree it is strong enough to withstand all pressure it is strong enough to withstand the change in the seasons it is strong enough to withstand the public saying this is wrong as long as the conviction is there as long as the individual knows that he is doing wrong he will not be able to face himself he will not be able to face his conscience so he must be convinced that he is right and that his work will benefit mankind let us quickly go through what we have done today um we started off with sir richard steel 
talking about um, public opinion and how far it, uh, it forms human beings and still talking about reason, living in the age of reason, gives us examples of how talent must be appreciated only when it is put to positive use, only when it benefits mankind, should this talent be appreciated. He says, um, human beings have a tendency to be governed by their feelings and emotions and sentiments, but they must be made to understand that good intentions are necessary if any good is to be derived from a particular talent. It could be physical beauty, it could be um, a keen wit, it could be intelligence. All these, he says, will only contribute to the greatness of a man if they are supported with good intentions, if they have right on their side. And he gives various examples. He gives the example of a young man who cannot differentiate a coquette from an innocent beauty because he is governed by his feelings and emotions. He doesn't use his brain. He doesn't use his judgment. Steel because he belonged to the age of reason, um, recommends, advises very strongly, advocates the cause of reason and says we must use our judgment, we must use our powers of discrimination to tell right from wrong, to tell good from evil. We must not be taken in by appearances. And then he goes on and he gives the example of a lawyer and he says that the legal profession is one of those professions that has uh, throughout history been upheld as the best uh, profession. And yet what has uh, happened in the legal profession is that we base our judgments of lawyers not on the basis of whether they uphold the cause of truth, justice and righteousness, but we base our judgment on the power to convince. And the power to convince is something that is taught to lawyers. It's something that they um, that, that, that is a skill that they learn when they are studying law. So a man who gives a convincing argument is not the best lawyer and we must not praise, admire, appreciate such people who can win you over through their speech. We must put intention side by side with appearance. It is only thus that we will be able to discriminate between good and evil, between truth and falsehood, between justice and oppression. The, um, the winding or the concluding argument that Steele gives is that people who uphold the cause of justice, people whose intentions are good, will be able to um, make a place in society regardless of how, how much opposition they face, regardless of the hindrances, the obstacles that are put in their path. They will be able to achieve greatness because they have good intentions, because they are working for the benefit of mankind, because their only aim is to improve the lot of humanity. And such people will persevere 
regardless of the hindrances and obstacles because such people are like the oak tree and that's one of the the best examples that steel can can provide because the oak tree is a symbol of solidity a symbol of strength a symbol of perseverance and he says that like the oak tree there might be hindrances and obstacles just as the oak tree faces autumn and winter in the hope that spring will follow therefore these people who set out to do good for humanity who set out to work for the benefit of mankind these people will persevere because they might encounter obstacles they might encounter hindrances in various forms they might um, come across people who condemn them who talk against them um, they might come across people who uh, try to prevent them from uh, from from doing good for mankind but they will persevere because the will to persevere the will to do good the will to work for the benefit of mankind is stronger than the will to hinder the will to stop a person so in this battle between what steel terms as good and evil good virtue justice truth honesty will persevere will win out because the intention is to benefit humanity the intention is to benefit mankind the intention is not to gather praise and approbation for oneself it is not appreciation the intention is to benefit mankind and this selfless intention will win out over all evil powers all powers of darkness thank you very much for being patient that's all for today allah hafiz